Professor Omar Yaghi, congratulations. I mean, wow, it is such an honor to be talking to you, um, the first Saudi scientist to, be win to win a, a Nobel Prize. I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here today. And when your name was announced in Stockholm, was it a moment of surprise or more of the accumulation of a lifelong uh, uh, inner journey, so to speak? It was, it was a surprise. I mean, I received the call from the committee uh, when I was landing in Frankfurt and taking my bags to deplane. So it was very surprising, and I was right there in the plane while they were uh, telling me that I have been awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And they were talking about the different uh, presentations that they were going to make in 90 minutes uh, before the official announcement. And they asked me whether I would be available to uh, give interviews. And I said, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to because I would be on my next flight during that time. So uh, it, was, uh, it was absolutely fantastic. And there is, uh, you can't prepare for moments such as this. Yes, I can imagine. Well, tell me more about how you felt. Um, how did it feel after all this hard work that you've been doing, uh, all this research you've been doing to finally have this moment announced? Well, I think scientists do science for two reasons. One is that they want to stimulate their mind, advance the frontiers of knowledge for the benefit of humanity, but they also want to be recognized for their work. And uh, I think that those are two important components. If you ask a scientist to work in an isolation and they can't report their work, they can't talk about their work, they probably wouldn't do it. So, so I think that this is uh, important to keep in mind, is that we, um, we work for advancing the frontiers of knowledge. And when our research, our results have benefit to society, it's really an amazing feeling. And to be called by uh, the Nobel Committee, which is the highest honor a scientist could receive, uh, that's just an icing on the cake. And it, uh, it's really part of an important legacy for a scientist to, um, to be uh, awarded uh, such a prize. It also, I think the prize uh, allows us to, um, the, especially the emerging uh, generation, to, to uh, open their eyes to what is possible. I think it enhances the science, it encourages the youth, and it brings the science up front and center in society. I think those are very, very important for um, building an education, educated uh, society. I can imagine, Anna, and I will get back to that in just a moment. Professor, now, as the first scientist carrying the name of Saudi Arabia to receive a Nobel in chemistry, how does this reflect on the significant advancement Saudi Arabia is witnessing in the fields of research, development, and as well as innovation? Well, first, I want to thank uh, His Majesty King Salman bin Abdulaziz, and I also want to thank um, the Crown Prince um, his Royal Highness um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman for the support that they've shown me uh, during the last years for supporting uh, my research, encouraging me. Uh, I think this is important to mention. It's a uh, science cannot be done in vacuum. It's uh, it it requires a lot of different uh, contributions from different sides, and and they have done a tremendous job in supporting me. I also want to thank um, CAXT, uh, King Abdulaziz City of Science and Technology, uh, for their collaboration, uh, scientific collaboration, over the last many years. These two aspects have helped me craft uh, our research and direct our research in directions that benefit uh, society. And we've taken the basic science all the way to applications and to commercialization through these uh, uh, collaborations and through the support of uh, His Majesty and, and His Royal Highness uh, uh, in, in, this, in this regard. And I just want to mention that and thank them very much. This is an important time to acknowledge the people who have contributed to, uh, to my success. 
Um, in terms of its impact on society, I think the kingdom has is is going through an amazing transformation to become a um, uh, an important contributor to the world scene of science uh, and not just science but also technology. And you can see every day different initiatives such as the Al Fainu uh, initiative, which is an important initiative for uh, evolving the science. Uh, in the kingdom, this is this is very important. The kingdom has a lot of smart uh, people, and especially um, in in universities. And these initiatives are very important at providing them opportunities, opening the door for them to um, experience and achieve their potential. Beautiful, completely agree, Professor. Now. Let's talk a little bit science. When, when you first imagined materials uh, molecule by molecule, did you ever think it will lead to drinking water from air desert? I mean, such a radical transformation, at least for me. <laughs> um, good, very good question. Uh, when I set out to do research, I really just, I wanted to build materials like one would build Legos or um, take molecules like building blocks and put them together to make different forms. And uh, that was very, very exciting. And I did it, honestly, I did it because I am I love molecules and I love the beauty of molecules. The, their their mo molecules is what attracted me to chemistry when I was 10 years old. I discovered drawings of molecules. We call them stick and ball diagrams. And I didn't know what they were at 10 years old, but certainly I figured out in future that these are molecules and I became more and more interested in them and uh, I became uh, uh, deeper and, and went into the knowledge deeper and deeper. And uh, finally, I had my independent position at Arizona State University back in 1992. And there I was free to exercise my ideas. Um, and, uh, and again, we wanted to implement the concept of building materials from molecular building blocks, and we succeeded. And that was an amazing uh, moment. But once you build materials, and you, and, and in this case, we have basically opened a gold mine where any molecule could be stitched together to make a new material. So the possibilities are almost endless. Now, it's not just beauty of what you've created, but also now we have to ask questions about what are they useful for? And that's when we embarked on um, applying the chemistry to taking water out of desert air to make drinking water, uh, taking CO2 out of the air to clean the air, um, and and many uh, storing hydrogen into the pores to make clean energy. So all these things uh, are a progression of the initial success that we've had in assembling materials from the molecular building block approach. And that's what the committee has cited uh, for um, the development of metal organic frameworks. Well, it is, it is an amazing uh, um, accomplishment indeed, Professor. Now, will MOFs uh, one day allow entire cities to run on captured water and recycled air? I mean, is that science fiction or an, an engineering deadline, so to speak? Well, uh, it sounds like science fiction. In fact, there were movies uh, made about trapping water from Correct. air. But <laughs> the power of these materials is that they can make dreams come to reality. And this is the beauty of it. We have a startup um, called Atoko in the uh, uh, south of um, uh, Los Angeles in Irvine that is already testing devices um, that would deliver 2,000 liters a day from trapping water out of the air and requiring very little energy. They also have another product that would deliver 850 liters a day of water, clean drinking water, uh, using only ambient sunlight, 
no electricity, just a no power input, just ambient sunlight. So this means that these products will be widely deployed in cities, villages, everywhere where there is a need for clean water. Uh, so this is not science fiction anymore. It is, it is reality and it's made so by metal organic frameworks. Beautiful, beautiful. And we look forward to having that implemented in, in many, many other uh, cities around the world, especially in, in countries of need. So, Professor, allow me to ask you this. Is there a discovery you dream of that science hasn't yet caught up with? Uh, well, yes, we. <laughs> I dream a lot about the future. And uh, you have as, as the saying say, you have to have a dream for a dream to come true. And scientists in general, and especially, especially me, I was taught by my father and then by my PhD mentor that you have to do something completely new, okay? Completely new as a scientist. And that's what we strive for. Yes, right now I have dreams. I have ideas on how we can take this chemistry to the next level, which is, could we design MOFs that operate like DNA, meaning that they have sequences of information that code for very specific properties. They could be carbon capture and conversion of carbon to useful materials. That could happen in just one material. That's what we're working on now. Uh, it's a big challenge. If we can solve it, then we would have completely changed further the way people think about making materials. So that's one direction. The other direction is that we have um, many ideas on how we can accelerate discovery using AI, using uh, machine learning and uh, large language models, AI tools that allow us to take things that we research for two to three years to achieve a result and reduce that time down to just weeks. Uh, we, have, we have already preliminary results that show that we can speed up the um, discovery of new materials so that we can achieve new materials that have very specific applications much quicker, 50-fold faster than what we, are, what we have been doing. So the future is very bright, and we only scratch the surface. There's a lot more work to do. And uh, we have many, many ideas about how these materials can be modified further and with the use of AI, completely transform the way material science and chemistry work. This is something that uh, I might add is a significant part of my collaboration with, with CAXT in Saudi Arabia. Amazing. I'm glad to hear that you have the support for that amazing vision that you have, Professor. Now, allow me to end with this. After winning this uh, uh, prize, what messages do you have to all the youth? I mean, you mentioned earlier how important this prize is for the youth, and especially the youth of Saudi Arabia, that you made this possible for every single child in Saudi Arabia to look up to having a Nobel one day in their lives. And not only in Saudi Arabia, but all the Arab children look up to you in that. So what are your messages to them? Well, my message for Saudi Arabia is that you live in an amazing country that has tremendous resources and leadership that has the will to put those resources behind your education and behind the development of science and technology. This is a time in the history of science where it's never been better to do science. We have amazing equipment, amazing facilities that provide amazing opportunities for young people to engage in science. And as I mentioned with AI, this becomes even um, transformative to one's opportunities and for them to plug into solving uh, societal challenges and developing technologies to make um, better uh, uh, standards of life for not just Saudis, but everyone in the region and the world. So my advice to them would be science allows you to get to the top the quickest. Okay, it just requires patience and you have to do the experiment. If you do the experiment, you have the possibility to discover. And when you discover, you discover it could transform the world. So I think that, that my message is uh, to, do, to, to do the experiment and to be bold and not afraid to try new things. 
So the experiment is paramount to discovery. I agree. I think having the courage to experiment unknown things is absolutely the key to some amazing adventures and findings. Professor Omar Yaghi, congratulations again. The first Saudi Thank scientist so to get a Nobel Prize in chemistry. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you for your interest and uh, for this wonderful uh, interview.